Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents Real Science Now, featuring top experts in science and medicine, covering everything from new planets to curing cancer to virtual reality and many topics in between. The Real Science Now lectures are hosted by the Great Lakes Science Center and presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University, its College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Thank you for joining us. My name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins. Today's program features three presentations entitled HIV, Where We Go From Here, Environmental Crises, Water, Biodiversity and Climate Change, and Math Modeling, From Fish Schools to Gang Behavior to Medicine. Let's begin with Dr. Jonathan Karn talking about the HIV AIDS virus and how we treat it. It's now almost exactly 35 years uh, since the first cases of uh, AIDS uh, were recognized in the US. And for those of you who aren't um, old enough to remember that time, uh, it was a terrifying disease. Uh, patients would uh, come in uh, very ill, uh, waste away within six months, and it was uh, regarded as a death sentence. It um, taxed the uh, health providers uh, enormously, emotionally, and many of them were concerned that uh, treating the patients would put them and their families uh, at risk. I think the closest an analogy uh, to what happened uh, with HIV in the early days in the US is the recent panic over Ebola. And somehow, infectious diseases, uh, I think in many ways, bring out the worst of us in terms of a society. There tends to be finger pointing, stigmatization, uh, parochialism. Now, HIV has been uh, a tremendous success story. In fact, it's now reached the point, 35 years later, where in many senses it's um, a treatable, chronic condition, and uh, people tend to forget about it. And we've gotten to the point where uh, we can begin to ask, uh, is it possible to create a world that's actually uh, free of uh, HIV? And uh, there are people, uh, uh, you know, seriously uh, making commitments to in the next couple of decades, uh, achieving this. Now, ordinarily with um, an infectious disease, you would have a vaccine to fall back on. And in the case of HIV, this has been uh, scientifically extremely challenging. And uh, I think that it's very unlikely uh, within the next 15 years that there'll be an effective uh, universally applicable vaccine. On the other hand, there are other approaches uh, using uh, tremendously effective uh, antiretroviral drugs and other measures that uh, may actually succeed. Now, that's not to belittle the efforts to make vaccines. Ultimately, uh, that's going to be the uh, strongest weapon in the arsenal. But um, they're not immediately there. So what one needs to do is find ways to intervene uh, with people who are infected to prevent disease, because infection and the disease are not equivalent, and there there has been great success. We want to prevent new infections, uh, people getting the disease, uh, and it is still a serious public health problem. And then for people who are already infected, we want to actually cure them uh, to eliminate the virus and be able to get them off uh, antiretroviral treatment. And so what I'm going to do today is uh, focusing more on the drug side of things, uh, tell you uh, where we've been and where we're going. One thing that's uh, evident is that HIV infections haven't gone away around the world. In fact, they're more or less at a steady state. And the biggest burden of infections are in sub-Saharan Africa, where there are about 
25 million or so infections. Uh, but in the US and Western Europe, there are about 2.4 million. And to drill down a little bit, uh, in the US AIDS epidemic, there have been about 575,000 deaths in the course of the epidemic. This is close to the number of deaths in the American Civil War. Uh, and it is also um, about twice the number of deaths in World War II, about 10 times the number of deaths in Vietnam. There are currently anywhere between 500,000 and, 500, and a million people in the US uh, living with uh, HIV. And sadly, a significant number of them do not know that they're infected. Uh, and this is a public health challenge and issue. There are about 18,000 uh, deaths a year in the US and about 56,000 new infections. Now, the photograph shows uh, uh, a display of the AIDS quilt in 2002 in Washington. Each one of those panels is a tribute to uh, a person who died of AIDS uh, made by their family. And I have to tell you that it's a way of getting some sense of what these numbers mean. This is a small fraction of it. In fact, on the mall, it stretched the entire length of the mall from uh, the World War II memorial up to the steps of the Capitol. And if you ever get, it's rarely displayed in Toto, but if you ever get a chance uh, to see it, it's uh, uh, very touching. So what is HIV? Well, it's a virus, and a virus is a molecular parasite. It can't grow on its own. It can only replicate if it uh, infects a cell. In uh, genetic terms, it's uh, kind of a hybrid. It starts off life uh, as a messenger, as an RNA copy of itself, uh, but it's in a family of viruses that can convert itself back into DNA, the genetic material in your chromosomes, integrate, and then persist as, uh, for all intents and purposes, a new gene. Unfortunately, it's a gene that uh, is able to cause a disease. And the reason why it kills disease, uh, causes disease is that it uh, destroys a population of cells called T cells which are required uh, to mount an effective immune response. So the reason why people with uh, HIV are prone to opportunistic infections is that their immune system is compromised. They're unable to fight off infections because they're unable to effectively recognize that an incoming bacteria or other virus is um, a uh, a foreign entity and mount an appropriate immune response. What this uh, looked like in, in untreated infections in the early days is that there's a rapid decline in this population of cells known as the CD4 uh, positive T cells. These are the mediators of the immune response that I was referring to. This is kind of the clinical view but I think an easier way to think about this is with uh, about this car uh, racing to disaster. Uh, as the amount of virus goes up, the number of CD4 T cells goes down. And once you reach a point where in an untreated infection, uh, there are effectively no longer any more cells in this class, then uh, the immune system is completely compromised and the patients will die of uh, opportunistic infections, other infections. Now, treatment of HIV was revolutionized uh, starting in the 1990s by the development of extremely effective antiretroviral drugs. And you heard from uh, Stan with the cancer moonshot that they want to accelerate the production of new drugs from uh, you know, five years to 10 years. 
Uh, that's because the targets in, uh, in cancer are very difficult uh, to identify and you need to look for specificity. In the case of antiretrovirals, it's rather easy. What you want to target is the virus. And uh, the virus is producing unique enzymes that are required for its replication. And so you can make very effective drugs that are very specific for the virus itself. And as a result of this, uh, it's now close to, it's more like 35 licensed drugs over 35 years. Uh, but it's been a huge triumph for uh, medicine and uh, the pharmaceutical industry to be able to uh, make these drugs uh, in such a rapid way. And uh, one of the things that was noted is that it, no matter how potent a single drug is, it doesn't do the job alone. And you need to use multiple drugs, combinations of drugs. So I'm going to try to explain to you why you need combinations of drugs, uh, despite the, um, uh, the potency, and then what that also means in terms of going forward. So the problem is drug resistance. And you've probably heard about this also in the context of uh, bacterial infections, uh, antibiotic resistance uh, uh, that arises. In the case of uh, a virus uh, like HIV, its ability to uh, mutate, to make multiple uh, copies of itself, is extremely high. In fact, in an untreated infection, there's something like 10 to 11 particles being produced per day in the infected uh, patient. That's a big number. It's uh, uh, 100 billion. And the genome is very small. So the consequence of this number is that within that population, there's a mutation in every single position in the virus. It doesn't stop there. Within that population, there's a mutation in two out of the genome for every pairwise combination. Doesn't stop there. Uh, in the population, uh, there's uh, three, and that's where it saturates. Now, most of those mutations are deleterious. They inactivate the virus. But the possibility of finding a way to evade uh, the viral response or the immune response is enormously high. So you have to trap the virus. And the way to trap the virus is to hit it in multiple places at the same time, and that seems to work. So I don't know how many people here are gardeners. Uh, my, gardener, my garden often ends up with weeds. Uh, and I think uh, you can see it's the same sort of issue. If you uh, use a single agent, and especially if you use a single agent uh, that's not at a high enough level, uh, you'll kill off some weeds, but then other weeds will start growing, and particularly resistant weeds will grow. And in that circumstance, what you want to do is first get rid of the first weed killer, because that's simply allowing resistant weeds to grow and then come in with uh, multiple uh, uh, weed killers, and uh, that will uh, let you, allow you to get control of the population. And that's really the principle behind combination drug therapy as it's used in HIV. Now, that principle has recently been applied to hepatitis C, and there is, in, in effect, uh, a true cure in the case of hepatitis C. The new drug combinations will cure over 90% of people who are infected, and it is a genuine cure. The virus is gone, and uh, it won't come back. We're not in that situation with HIV yet, but many of the principles developed with HIV uh, were applied uh, in the case of uh, hepatitis C. Now, the drugs can also, in principle, be used uh, to prevent infections. 
And one obvious thing is that a patient who's extremely well suppressed with these drugs is not producing virus and will, has a very limited, it's not impossible, but uh, extremely unlikely uh, chance of transmitting uh, the infection. So a well-treated population uh, is a much safer population. It is also, in principle, uh, possible to uh, treat people with drugs who are at risk for acquiring infection. And, uh, but that presents particular challenges. One is that uh, many of the people at risk have uh, uh, fallen out of the safety net in our society. Uh, they're they're uh, suspicious of uh, health institutions, of medical care. Many of them are drug addicts. Uh, and there are other uh, issues of, of this difficult, in these difficult uh, to, to reach populations. But one of the remarkable things that's happened in the last couple of years is the development of drugs uh, that can last an extremely long time in the body. Uh, and the, at Merck right now, there's some agents in development that can last about six months. Uh, these are still in the testing phase, but I think it's potentially a game changer because it means instead of uh, somebody having to uh, take a pill on a daily basis, be very rigorous about their compliance, uh, they can be treated several times a year and uh, I think that will improve management dramatically. So that's an exciting uh, new development. Getting to the work that I do, um, this is question of why can't you get rid of HIV with the drugs we have? Uh, because they're extremely potent. And the reason why we can't do this is that uh, they're not 100% effective. Uh, and the virus is able to persist uh, in uh, the bodies of, of people who are well treated, both because there's some parts of the body where the drugs don't penetrate very well. These are privileged, immune, uh, privileged sites. They're also privileged often in terms of uh, being um, separated from the immune system. Uh, again, going back to Ebola, you might have heard the story about Ebola uh, lasting in the eyes of uh, some patients. That's an example of a privileged site where you can have persistent replication. Uh, there is also um, a problem of what's known as latently infected cells. And here it's where the virus has gotten into a cell, integrated, uh, and is laying low. It's a way that the virus can escape immune responses, but equally it's a way the virus can escape drugs. So if the virus is laying low, uh, if you take away the drugs, out it pops. That's the reason why uh, people who uh, have HIV infections must rigorously and continuously take their antiretroviral medicines. If they interrupt their treatment, the virus will come back. And, and that's a big cost, a big adherence issue. So we're working on a, uh, in a general uh, concept of, of saying, well, maybe we can find ways of getting rid of uh, the virus that's laying low, that's latent. And we're doing this in a very counterintuitive way. Uh, we're saying, let's find a method where we say to the virus, wake up. And the reason why we want the virus to wake up is because then it can be a target for the immune system. The immune system uh, almost by definition in the case of HIV patients, uh, has failed. If the virus is still there, the immune system didn't clear it. So you need to do something else. You need to enhance, in a specific way, the immune responses. So wake up and get shot. It's, uh, I used to make an analogy to trench warfare in, in World War I. You want to get the guys to stick their heads up over the parapet so you can shoot them. We're uh, doing this now using a, a special soldier in the immune system called a natural killer cell. And uh, these are frames from a movie 
which actually show the natural killer cells, which are in blue, uh, targeting and killing uh, a cell where we woke up HIV, and it's uh, labeled in green, and there's selective killing. In practice, uh, we're thinking about a rather kind of futuristic approach. Uh, but this is something that's also analogous to the problem that you have in cancer um, immunotherapies as well. You're looking for a rare cell that's not very different from any other cell, and you want to target it so, uh, selectively for, uh, for elimination. So some of the things we're working on are giving the cells more specificity with specific receptors, giving them signals so they can go to specific places where the virus is also present. And uh, in that way, uh, we hope in, in the future we'll be able to affect a cure. So thank you. You've been watching Jonathan Karn talking about progress in addressing HIV AIDS. Up next is Dr. Chris Cullis discussing the impact of climate change on water resources and biodiversity. Now, back to the talk. Climate change is real. The world is, is heating up. There's lots of things that are going to happen from that. <coughs> um, it's, again, it's climate. The question is about climate change. Um, who believes what? There's a lot of stuff going on. I, I think the data is incontrovertible at this stage. Uh, but people like to say, oh, it's a blip. It's, a statistical anomaly, um, if we wait long enough so the statistical anomaly is no longer a statistical anomaly, it's going to be really hard to do anything about it. So I'd rather take the precautionary uh, position at this stage to make sure that one does what one can do that day. Uh, and the, you, know, you, saw the, you saw the graph a couple of talks ago that, that, that 2014 was higher, 2015 was higher, and 2016 is going to be warmer still. And this is again the whole piece of, which we've just been through. Um, it's getting warmer, glaciers are melting, sea levels are rising. I'm not buying any below sea level properties in Belgium or Holland. Uh, the dikes are good, but I'm not sure that they're going to be that good. Uh, the fact that these things are changing is changing the habitat for lots of different, both animals and plants. So with the, both with pollution and with, the, with climate change and as rainfall changes, we're actually going to get a lot of species loss at this point. Um, many of them we don't even know about. So we're still identifying new species at this stage. Uh, lots of those we're not going to identify because they're simply not going to be here at the, at the end. <coughs> Bird migration patterns are changing. Um, pollination times are fluctuating. Uh, things, heat especially. So um, if you, when we have heat waves late summer, uh, one of the big effects is, in fact, the Chicago mercantile where uh, corn futures prices go up sky high. And that's because for many of our crop plants, there's actually a level above which they don't, they don't set seeds. So if you get a high enough temperature at the right time, the corn doesn't make any pollen. All right? People try to grow wheat, and they're growing wheat in Africa. And one of the problems with that is, is that in the summer in Africa, it's too hot, so wheat's even worse. So corn, at least, will pollinate it up to about 40 degrees centigrade. For wheat, at 30 degrees centigrade, there is no pollen made at all. There is no wheat product, all right? So that if you want to grow that, you have to grow it in the winter in, in places where it's hot in the summer, and usually those places don't have any rain in the winter, so they have to be irrigated, and water is another problem. And so we have all of these things uh, are changing. And temperature is an incredibly important part of the whole ecosystem and, and how plants and animals function. Um, the Bureau of Land Management is obviously trying to expand forested public lands as a carbon sink to reduce that. Um, wildlife biologists are also trying to find out where you can get corridors, where you can maintain um, diversity. One of the issues really is, and I'll come to that in a minute, is we don't, know, we don't know enough about the diversity to know what we need to keep. All right? There's a lot of stuff we don't know. You, you look at things, and they all sort of all look the same. However, there may be, a, there may be some 
very unique combinations that we would like to know about that we may lose because we simply don't have time to, to get enough information. Um, there's about 20,000 edible species of plants, right? 20 of them provide us with about 90% of our food and nearly all of these, because of the way we've bred them, are, are very fragile, the top. So it's like putting all your eggs in one basket and then you know, we'll, we'll cook them and see if they're still alive afterwards. Um, the other part about it is, is that as, this, as extreme weather events go, so both drought and heat are really deleterious to all of our food crops and the three main food crops are reese, wheat, rice and maize and they make up 50% of our global um, calories. Okay. And they don't like heat uh, there's, there's, and drought. So there's a maize crop that not going to have too much from that one. Um, here's some Here's a rice trial, and you can see the differences in the uh, color of those rice plants as those which are um, more drought sensitive than others. But rice is really very drought sensitive. You know, rice you, likes to grow in paddy fields where it's really wet and it's still difficult to have it. As, as, as we get places that are drier, it won't work. Um, this is one that may be harder to see, but the one on the left really has much smaller heading and, and many fewer seeds than the one on the right because the one on the right is more drought tolerant. And so as soon as you start getting drought, you start getting a huge amount of um, loss of productivity. There's a significant discussion about what we mean by drought tolerance. So some people would say that, well, if, a plant, if, it, if the drought hits the wrong time and it manages to stay alive and then can, can go on growing, that one is tolerant. A lot of those ones do that, but they still don't produce any seeds at the end. There's another one which says, if a drought hits, then what you want is a plant that says, ah, and I'm going to make what, whatever seeds I can make, I'm going to mobilize everything, I'm going to make as many seeds as I can now. So you're guaranteed of some yield. And there's a, there's a lot of discussion as to which way around you we should be trying to, to breed for. Um, so this gives you some idea of the kinds of diversity. So these are cowpeas, and they're actually quite a, a large um, food source, especially in, in the developing world. And there's, there's a huge amount of variability that, we've been, that have been collected, but there's a relatively small number of species for which there's this kind of variability collected. Um, we're trying to collect those, and there's a lot of really interesting species that nobody knows really anything about. There is, there is perhaps anecdotal information about that. Um, and these are called orphan crops, and this is one of them here, and I'm going to talk about this one um, now. They have useful and probably important characteristics. So this is called the marama bean. It grows in, in the Kalahari sands in southern Africa. It likes to grow in really, really dry areas. So you can see it's growing there. It's not quite desert, but it's pretty close. Um, it has these large beans that are produced that are actually better protein than soya bean. Um, they're, they're about 40% protein. They're 45% oil. They're incredibly rich. The sand bushmen have been using them for years or centuries. Um, it's never been grown as a crop. It's collected out of the wild, literally. And so that's, that's also an issue because as population pressures increase, you actually lose that diversity. Um, it is very drought tolerant, and part of its drought tolerance is that it makes a tuber. If I can get this one out, it does have one. I'll keep most of the sand in there. If I can pull it out. So that's, that's the tuber. So this has been growing in that pot of sand that you saw it there for two years with tap water. It's had nothing else, all right? It's just been taking light, whatever nutrients you get from the tap water, and it grows. And you can see that was last year's stem. This is this year's stem. When it grows in the wild, you can see it grows as, oops, go back one. It grows as this big trailing vine that makes, that then has lots of flowers and lots of seeds. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to understand you know, what grows well, what produce lots of flowers, how much seed can we produce, and so we can actually have this as a crop for resource performers, for farmers in this region where there are no other crops that can grow. I mean, there's nothing, you can't grow soybean here, you can't grow even cowpeas, right? Nothing else will grow on this land, right? It's essentially, you know, it's semi-arid arid desert, it gets rain in the summer to some of it. This thing stores 
water in this tuber and will in fact sprout before it even sees. So actually, last year I did an experiment that I wasn't expecting to. I just turned the water off in the greenhouse where they were sitting in February and left them. So they, hadn't, they, they, were, they were sitting in a pot like that, dried out for th four months. In, in May, they all started to sprout. I hadn't turned the water on. No? In summer, the days were longer, had more light. Hey, it's time to grow. So I turned the water on and they grow fine. All right? As I say, they, they produce really good tubers. Those are also edible. Um, and so they can be really large. Uh, they're cold water, so they have a reservoir. So they can probably actually get through a full year without any rain and actually produce seed that, that during that year. Um, <clears throat> it also has a number of interesting properties. It has uh, the tuber and the outside of the seed coat has antiviral properties. Um, this plant makes an elastase inhibitor. An elastase is a, a, a protease that breaks down the basement membrane. So it's, it's, it's very important for people who have various lung diseases. In fact, the, the elasticity of the lungs is because of elastase. The loss of, a loss of elasticity of the lungs is because of elast, elastase function. So if you have elastase inhibitor, it would be for that. It's also, there's a lot of interest by cosmetic companies because many wrinkles are caused by the fact that the elastic properties of the facial skin are not great. And so there's a, so this particular crop in this area could provide food, it could provide a cash crop with the remains of it, and so it's something that we're trying to look at. And so the seeds are collected at the moment because it's not grown, we don't know what we're losing. So we don't know the amount of variability that there is. We're looking to, to do some surveys. Um, and so we're doing this, I'm doing this actually as part of a course that I run. I have about 30 students. We've got a genome sequence. We've got some other uh, information from it. In the spring next year, we'll take a subset of these and we're going to do field work to actually work out what the pollination schemes are and to start collecting some to, to make uh, seed orchards so we can have improved seed for um, distribution to farmers. Um, so that's that one. Orphan crops, can, you know, some of them can be really successful and can displace other things. Um, quinoa uh, is one that's, that's suddenly been taken off, but then it's not as, as stress tolerant as some of its relatives. And so when you get a bad year, have you, if you've displaced the mixture that you normally get, what happens? Um, so climate change is placing new stress on both the food supply and biodiversity. Uh, we need to do a lot of collection of representative sets. So you, know, you don't need to collect a sample from every plant, but you really want to know what the diversity is and somehow capture that. Um, and these have a lot of traits that are really important and really useful um, for putting in our major crops as well as developing new crops. And so I think we need to do that. And I'll go back to the previous one and say one of the ways in which we might be trying to do that is taking some of the genes from some of these crops and putting them into our major food crops. Thanks. You've been watching Chris Cullis talking about some of the effects of climate change. Up next is Dr. Alethea Barbaro discussing how we use mathematics to model natural systems like fish migration. Now, back to the talk. I'm going to talk to you today about mathematical modeling. Um, I'm hoping to make it very exciting, so um, bear with me here. Um, I um, will start with fish. So we're going to be talking about actually mathematical models, models for social organisms. We're going to be talking about mathematical modeling for different kinds of animals that interact among themselves. So they're going to be, um, they're going to be animals that are in some social way interested in other animals. We'll get there in a minute. I want to give you a little summary of what mathematical modeling for me is. Okay. So there's a lot of different types of mathematical modeling in math departments all over the world. Um, the particular brand that I do um, is a kind of mathematical modeling called agent-based mathematical modeling. Basically, I think about little particles. Okay. And I, you know, if I'm to represent myself with a particle, I'm going to take my center of mass and I'm basically going to think about where my center of mass is moving. Okay? And um, what I want to be thinking about is how my center of mass is moving in a group of a whole bunch of other people. Right? So each person's center of mass is going to be labeled as a particle. 
and I'm going to be thinking about the way that I interact with the person next to me. Maybe I don't want to get too close. Maybe I do want to be close, right? Different situations, you're going to have different um, reactions to the particles. You can also use this type of modeling, um, interacting particle modeling, for, um, for situations where the particles don't, don't really interact socially, right? You can think about um, in a gas, right? You have a whole bunch of particles moving around, and the particles might collide with each other, but they're not necessarily colliding on purpose. They're doing it because there's physics guiding the motion of those particles. So interacting particle models are actually um, widely applied. I, I generally use them for um, social organisms. Um, so interacting particle models, as I define it, are models where you have a whole bunch of particles, and the particles are, are given a set of rules to follow when they get close to the other particles. <clears throat> and these, these types of particle models, as I said, are very versatile. So in my particular work, I think about social organisms. So I think about fish. I actually do think about people moving around. Um, and I also um, have thought about this type of thing in medicine. So I thought about um, an intestine, and in the intestine there are these little finger-like projections that come up and help you digest the food, and sometimes they get inflamed. So I can also think about an inflamed villus as a particle if I want to, and it might, it might inflame the ones right next to it, and then you have a whole cluster of inflamed villi. So this type of model is actually, there's a few different ways of, um, of implementing it, but this type of model is used all over the place. Physics, medicine, sociology, criminology, biology, it's, the, it's really everywhere. But <clears throat> back to the fish. I started out with, um, with a species of fish called the capelin. Um, you can see here a male on the top and a female on the bottom. And um, you can see running down the middle of the fish there's a clear distinction between the dark part on the top and the light part on the bottom. Right at that dividing line, there's something called the lateral line. The fish uses it to sense its neighbor fish um, via the pressure in the water. Okay. So the fish have actually two sense organs. They have their eyes that you can see there at the front on their face, but they also have this thing called the lateral line. And these two things, the, these two sense organs help them keep particular fixed distance from other fish. Um, if you see a fish, you know, fish look very different often, but if you see one that has this very clear lateral line like this, it's very likely going to be a schooling fish, a fish that likes to move with a lot of other fish in a group, right? Um, so if you, if you think of different types of fish, there are some fish that like to school and some fish that don't. So if you look at a fish tank, for example, you can see the, the um, neon tetras, is that what they're called, tend to move together all as a group, and you can actually kind of identify where their lateral line would be. They, they use that to help them move together. And so the capelin actually live around Iceland. Um, there are several stocks, so there's some near Alaska also, but the one that I focused on was around Iceland. Um, I don't have a pointer here, so it's going to be mm, a little bit... Do you, do you have one? Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I guess um, <clears throat> the, the capelin actually live around Iceland, so Iceland is between Europe and Greenland, and, um, and the capelin are species that are basically, they spawn down on the southern coast generally, and then all the adults die. So the little ones, right, what, after they hatch, they don't really know where to go. They drift with the tidal current, and they drift around Iceland to this area here, and they mature there for about two or three years. When they're about two or three years old, they're then old enough and big enough to go off on their own, and they need to find a large food source to help them um, undertake their spawning migration, which they do next. Going back to climate change, there's, this is actually a very climate-dependent um, environment because what happens is in the spring when the light can penetrate the water better, there's this algal bloom right up in this area here near that little island called Yan Mayan, off in the upper middle right part of the screen. Um, <clears throat> so when the fish, when this algal bloom happens, algae is plant, right? The zooplankton come, they eat the phytoplankton, the algae, 
And then the capelin go up and eat a whole lot of the zooplankton and get really fat. And once they're really nice and fat, they head back down to this area around Iceland, just above Iceland, and they undertake what's called the spawning migration. During the spawning migration, they go generally clockwise around Iceland, occasionally counterclockwise, and end up down at the bottom of Iceland, down in this part that you can see protruding from the bottom. <coughs> so this is called the spawning migration. At this point, everything starts over. It happens every year. Right? Every year, some fish come of age and under, undertake this feeding and then spawning migration. And then the adults die. Okay. There's no way for the fish to know <coughs> from other fish where to go exactly. Right? Because all the adults die. Nobody does this twice. The spawning process is really, um, it's really a problem for the fish. They basically destroy their bodies in the, in the spawning process. So there's no fish following other fish around and saying, hey, go this way, hey, go that way, right? <clears throat> so um, my, my project in graduate school was to try to predict where the fish would go next, what's happening. And I used interacting particle models to do this. So basically, I thought about each fish as a particle, and I thought about the fish interacting with other fish, right? So this is the model that I used. Um, it's a little bit scary, I know it's, a, it's an equation on here, but I'll walk you through it. On the left-hand side, we have an x and a y coordinate for the fish. They're moving around in two-dimensional space. We're going to think about x as the horizontal direction, we're going to think about y as the vertical direction, and basically I have a particle that's moving around. Okay. The new location for the fish is on the left-hand side, that's the x at time t plus delta t and the y at time t plus delta t. That's a little bit after time t. Okay. So that's the location. And then the first term on the right-hand side, you can see that xk at time t, yk at time t, that's the location of the kth particle at time t. So basically, my new location on the left-hand side is where I used to be, right? And then plus two terms. The first term there, says delta t times vk of t. That's going to be the distance that I travel. Delta t times the velocity that I'm going is going to give me the distance that I went. Okay? And I have to go that distance in a certain direction. That certain direction is my dk of t. Okay? So I didn't tell you how that dk of t was, was figured out. We're going to do that in the next slide. Um, but basically what I have is the distance that I went in the direction that I went. Okay? And that's how I update my location. And that last term there, that C P K tilde of T, right? That's actually the current moving me around. So in my system, I think about fish moving around in water, right? And obviously the way the water's moving is going to affect the way that the fish move. So what I'm saying here with my equation is that my new position is where I used to be, plus the distance that I went on purpose, plus the, um, the distance that I went because the current was pushing me that way. All right. <clears throat> so how about that capital D sub K? That capital D sub K, K is where I want to go, right? OK, so now we're going to walk through another little thing here. If you can see in the bottom of the slide, I have a little fish at the center of three concentric circles, right? That's my, my kth fish that I'm focusing on, all right? And that inner circle I'm calling my zone of repulsion. Inside my zone of repulsion, I want to get away from the fish inside that zone, okay? So if there's another particle, let's pretend that the podium is my, my subject fish, right? And I'm another fish. If I get too close to the podium, the podium's going to start to feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe there's going to be a collision, right? So the podium is going to try to head that direction. Okay. If, on the other hand, I'm in that annulus in the middle, I'm a little bit farther away. The podium's really comfortable with where I'm standing. Okay. If the podium is going this way, right, and I'm going this way, the podium might try to line up with me so that the podium and I can travel in the same direction. We can be a school together. Right. And if, on the other hand, I'm all the way over here, then the podium is going to feel like it wants to be closer to me, right? The podium is going to try to head towards me. 
OK. So it's got three competing things. It's got the zone of repulsion, where it feels uncomfortable. It's got the zone of orientation, where it wants to line up with me. Right? And then it's got out here a zone of attraction, where it wants to come towards me. Those three competing forces are right here um, for this DK that I have written here. This is the DK at the next time step. That's the direction that I want to head at the next time step. It's equal to <coughs> Um, the repulsive force, the desire to go away from particles that are too close, summed over all the particles that are too close. Right? The second term is the sum of all the directional headings for the particles that are the right distance away, right? the ones that it wants to align with. And this last term here is the, the <coughs> directions th to try to get closer to the particles it wants to try to get closer to the particles in the zone of attraction. Okay, so it has all of these different desires and it adds them all up to try to figure out where to go next. Right? So if we had um, the podium wanting to go that way because it wanted to avoid me, wanting to go that way because it wanted to align with me when I was at mid-distance, and wanting to go this way, we would probably end up with the podium sort of going this direction. Right? It would be a sum of those three vectors. <coughs> So that's how the social interaction works. But now we have to think also about, um, <coughs> about temperature, right? Fish aren't comfortable all the time. Fish are comfortable if we have, um, if, if they're in a temperature where they're comfortable. So on the top here, I've shown you the currents going around Iceland. Those basically go clockwise around Iceland. Okay, so if, they're, if it's the dark blue, it means the vectors are longer, the current is stronger. This is an approximation of the current field around Iceland. The bottom three are temperatures for three different years. I'm going to show you 85, 91, and 2008, because those are the case studies that I'm going to look at. Okay. Um, 1985, you can see a lump of cold water in the upper right-hand corner of the map. And the, and the colors down at the bottom, the yellow and red colors at the bottom, those show areas that are too hot for the fish. So the fish is going to try to swim between the areas that are too cold and too hot. It's going to do the same thing in 91 and in 2008, but you can see that that shifts as the time shifts. Um, <clears throat> so now that we look, take a second look at this model, right, we're going to decompose that capital D sub K, which was the direction that I want to go next term. The direction that I want to go next is going to be some balance between the interaction term, which tells me which way I want to go based on the other particles, and the reaction to the temperature. Okay. So the reaction to the temperature, I, I hid a little bit of stuff from you because I didn't tell you what this R is, but this R basically is a function to keep the fish in a comfortable temperature zone. All right. Now you guys get pictures, now that you've suffered through this slide. All right. <laughs> so the acoustic data that we got that we wanted to compare to is shown here. Um, upper left-hand corner is an early part of the migration. That's November 1st to 21st of 1984. The second picture is um, <clears throat> acoustic data from January to mid-February of 1985. You can see the dark colors are with where the fish were densest. The light colors are with where the fish weren't found in such density. And the zigzag lines are where the boats went to look for the fish. And the bottom picture, you can see actually the capelin coming into land. Um, they're coming in in this area of Iceland. Okay, and that happened in February of 1985. Um, in 1991, we have a similar migration. They went clockwise around Iceland. And then they came in, but that, that when they came in, they actually came in down in the bottom part of Iceland over here on the left, near um, Reykjanes. That's the name of that protrusion from Iceland. So what we wanted was a model that would use the same, um, the same parameter values. Everything would be the same except the position, the starting position of the particles and the temperature map. And we wanted to see if we could produce both of these different migrations with the same values. <coughs> so for 1984-85, you can see the high density of particles is yellow. And what we did is we um, basically advanced the particles all according to those rules that we went through so, so carefully. Okay? And so we've got, 
we've got the particles. You can see, I hope, that the particles are sort of um, thinning out into little schools and going clockwise around Iceland. That's so basically the way we want. Okay. And then in the bottom, I'm hoping you can see that the particles are coming into Iceland in just about the right place. Right? It's a different angle. Mathematical models are not perfect. I'm never going to claim they are, be, are as a mathematical modeler. But we can get something that looks a lot like the migration route. <coughs> um, and if we look here for 1991, we get a migration where actually some particles show up in the area when, where the fish came in 91 that they didn't go in 85. Okay. And then we did something that was hard. We tried to predict where they would go in 2008. Right. So in 2008, we started them out where where we heard that they had started, we let the model advance. Um, they couldn't find them in Iceland. All of the boats were waiting around this area, so the lower right-hand portion of Iceland. Um, in our model, we saw that they were going around Iceland, but they were going far away from the area where the fishing boats were and the marine research boats were. And then they were coming in in a different place than usual. They were coming in in that very bottom part of Iceland that sticks down in the bottom. Okay, and actually what happened this year is the Marine Research Institute of Iceland said no more fishing. You can't fish because we can't find the capelin. We think the stock might be too small for you to be able to take out any fish. And, um, <clears throat> and so they canceled fishing. And we told them, we think you're looking in the wrong spot. And in, um, <clears throat> in actually the end of February and the beginning of March, they found the fish came in pretty much precisely where we had predicted. So that was a very exciting moment as a mathematical modeler. <laughs> um, this is hopefully one example you can take away from, um, from this about what mathematical modeling is and what it does. I was hoping to talk to you also about a model I have for gang dynamics, but that'll have to wait until afterwards. But you can use these kinds of models in a lot of different situations to give a lot of insight um, into the behavior that you maybe can't always um, ask for. You can't always set up in a, in, um, in a lab or something. Right? You can actually have something run on a computer and look at what happens on the computer, do interventions on the computer to see what would happen if you change something. Right? And that allows you to have a lot of insight into a, a system that you couldn't get from a lab setting right? or from real world, real world manipulations. So thank you very much. The Real Science Now lectures are hosted by the Great Lakes Science Center and presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University, its College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. For more information on Real Science Now and the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.